Hey everyone, this is Hooty Hoot from the Sports Deli Podcast. Before we do the formal introduction for today's epic podcast, here's a little pre-podcast talk between our special guest hosts, Coach K, joining us again as a blast from the past, one of our original hosts here in the Sports Deli, and Rashawn McLeod, former guest on the show, who's also joining us today, and our very special, incredible guest, Jelani McCoy for this unbelievable two-part podcast right here on the Sports Deli. What's up, Lon? Who? What up? What's up, dog? UCLA, baby. You know I got to represent. Let's go. How are you feeling? I'm good, man. You going crazy yet? I've been going crazy. I just hide it well. Yeah. Yeah. You're a lot shorter on Zoom than you are on TV. Dude, you know, we all getting old, man. I mean, my, my spine isn't what, it used to, isn't what it used to be, man. Shit. Hey, you see that picture right there, Big J? Oh, God. <laughs> Bring that back. Bring that back. Hold on. Uh, That's... Rashawn. <laughs> my What's God. Going <laughs> Surprise, man. Surprise. Man, what's up, bro? <laughs> I'm good, bro. <laughs> I'm oh, good, man, bro. Rashawn, I was just telling somebody, uh, I work with Showtime, and they did the St. Anthony's doc. And oh, I was yeah. telling them, remember when I came to practice when you guys were in San Diego? There you go, yeah. That was yeah, funny, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I, you so went to St. Anthony's, right? I did, yeah. I yeah, went to yeah. Anthony's, yeah. It was you, went Jaleel Roberts. Jaleel maybe? Roberts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we had we had Roderick Rhodes as well. I forgot. So, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. We was yeah. Tough. yeah. We we had fun out there, man, out in your hometown, man. Yeah, man, y'all did. Y'all was clowning. I was like, I was almost came. You know, they they what? sent. Yeah, they sent a, a coach Hurley. You know what I mean? Because uh, my mentor, Coach Will Ridge, and Coach Hurley were tight. They were tight. So right. they did. You know, they did the whole thing. Hey, if he comes out here to New Jersey. We'll take care of him. We'll guarantee you he'll be a top five pick. You know what I mean? You got the whole little thing. And I was like, eh. Ah. Man, mm. shoot. If we, hey, we we was pretty damn good. If we had you, we might, we wouldn't have lost the two games we lost. <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, man. Who'd you lose to, Rashawn? Man. Dunbar. Yeah. Baltimore, and, and Dunbar, lost, Baltimore. Yeah, Dunbar. Yeah, they had Dante Bright and Keith Booth. And I mean, they were loaded. Was that post yeah. Muggsy? Was that after Muggsy graduated? Yeah, it was after Muggsy. Yeah, and um, and then and then we lost to Maris High School with Donnell Williams and and uh, Warren Anderson. Those guys, my junior year, we lost one. So yeah, we lost so one my games, senior. <laughs> yeah, man. We, yeah, it was it was it, it was bad for a lot of teams. <laughs> yeah, evil empire. Yeah, that's when we uh we we uh what was the kid name we played against? That was uh he dunked on he dunked on Billy Lovett so hard, the kid on our <laughs> team. It was not even we, we still clown him about that dunk to the day. It, he had a French name like Pierre something. I forget his name. But Who I, I, I know all, all about play. dunking. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. Hey, who? Hey, who? Did, did you, <laughs> what, hey, who? What, what, hold, hold up real quick. But I when I when I when I get when I have Ray on on Monday. And this is this is an exclusive. I'm gonna I'm opening with the strength shoes because oh, wow. he used strength shoes, and I made a ratchet pair. I cut up uh, an old pair of shoes, took the bottoms, and stacked them on the toe, and I made my own pair of ratchet ass strength shoes, and I gained eight inches that summer. Okay, you put hey. together some hoodie baguette, some uh, dance shoes. I, <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was in the first jump shoes video, man. My, you know, because Coach Hurley was the sponsor for the jump shoes. Yeah. And he did the first video, and my my um my sophomore year, man, we used to wear them, and uh, we, I mean, we had a bunch of them, and we used to practice in the summer with them on. <laughs> and we our first fifteen minutes of practice used to be with the jump shoes. So we did the we did the first video for the jump shoes. <laughs> Lucky you didn't rupture your Achilles, man. That thing puts a lot Dude. of pressure on the tendon. Hey, I, 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 nice I got somebody to blame. Them. I got I got somebody to blame that my hops ain't come the way that they were supposed to now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need to do a class action lawsuit against their ass. <laughs> Coach, I'd like to know why you didn't just get a pair. Why did why why did you have to construct your own? Your own shoe. Were you trying to make it better, or were you just on a budget? 
a hundred dollars. I saved a hundred dollars. Shit, uh, okay. Are you crazy. Okay, who? Hundred dollars was a bag back then too. Don't get yeah. it. Yeah, oh, man. Ninety one or whatever. Because, it was. Is that because yeah. you were born before sponsorship, Mike? <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon coming back into the sports deli talking shit. Yeah, well. <laughs> and if you have listened to previous episodes of the Sports Deli and you want to fast forward past the introduction and a word from our sponsors, please feel free to fast forward to the nine minute and 40 second mark of the podcast. And thank you again for joining us here in the Sports Deli. Welcome, first time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli. The Sports Deli is sponsored by Sport RX. Sport RX is the leader in sports prescription eyewear. You can find them online at sportrx.com. And don't forget to enter the code DELI10 at checkout for your special 10% discount. We also want to give props to PSK Collective. Be inspired in PSK, where their clothing promotes inclusivity, empowerment, and equality by supporting female athletes through the Women's Sports Foundation. You can find them online at pskcollective.com or at walmart.com. We also want to thank citylokes.com where you can get your own personalized hats and phone cases, tees, accessories, and much, much more. I ordered two hats and they're amazing. Uh, One of them says the Sports Deli and it has a California license plate and the other one has a Michigan license plate and says speak up and dribble, Black Lives Matter. So check them out at citylokes.com and don't forget to enter the code the sports deli at checkout for your special 10% discount. And we're so excited to finally be supporting Moolah Kicks. They're dropping in May of 2021. They are the first female only brand basketball shoe and you can find them online at Moolah, Moolah's M O O L A H Kicks like shoes. K I C K S, plural, moolahkicks.com. Again, much thanks to Natty White, the founder of Moolah Kicks. You can always send us an email to thesportsdeli at gmail.com. And you can also DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner or on Twitter at Michael Hootner. A little bit about your two co hosts today uh, Coach K coaches at Skyline High School in Seattle, Washington. He coached college basketball for a number of years. He worked with the Orlando Magic under Coach Chuck Daly in the late 90s. He's a yoga instructor and a yogi, and he was one of my college basketball coaches when I was at Goucher College. As for myself, Hootie Hoot, I coached college basketball for 23 years, 15 on the men's side and 8 on the women. And I now coach at a low-income, first-generation high school girls basketball here in San Diego. I played four years of college basketball. I'm a life coach. I have a beautiful daughter. I'm a professional basketball skills trainer. We love to share space with our guests here in the Sports Deli to talk about the intersection between race and sports, mental health and sports, equality, empowerment, empathy, leadership, education, sports, and solutions we want to help mobilize listen learn and pay it forward remember your voice matters when fighting systemic racism read a book acknowledge your white privilege watch a movie about institutional racism call your local or state representatives and or have a conversation with someone that doesn't look like you we have to change the economic educational police housing prison and voting suppression narratives that currently need to be changed in this country and the only way to do that is to listen and learn and then help be a part of the mobilization and change that we want to see we're so honored that you're joining us today and we hope that you can grab your favorite deli sandwich or bagel and your favorite beverage and let's do this together in the sports deli uh, all right, we want to welcome back Coach K into the Sports Deli and also welcome our guest host, Rashawn McLeod, former Duke Blue Devil under Coach K and former NBA player. And on this 23rd day of National Soft Pretzel Stress Awareness and Cannabis Awareness Month, we are joined by our very special guest, San Diego's very own, sort of, 
Jelani McCoy. He played at St. Augustine High School here in San Diego. He did not surf, but did skateboard until he was too tall. Mm -hmm. His dad, who was from Arkansas, was a great high school football player who later became a practice squad player with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Jelani started with football, but when he got taller, basketball was a natural progression. He always took the term student athlete to heart growing up and the experience of playing in the 95 McDonald's All-American game in St. Louis was incredible. But Jelani said it was in some of the practices leading up to the game with the likes of KG, Vince Carter, Mr. Big Shot, Chauncey Billups, and Paul Pierce that were not suitable for children. He later went mm. on to star at UCLA. He had a triple-double recording 15 points, 10 boards, and 11 blocks. Are you kidding me? Not your traditional triple-double. Anyway, he did it against the University of Maryland in his first big game while listening to Tupac before the game. He got drafted Ooh. in the second round by the NBA, by the then Seattle Supersonics in the second round with a 33rd overall pick and later won an NBA title in 02 playing with the Zen master Phil Jackson while playing alongside Kobe, Shaq, Rick Fox, D Fish, and D3 sensation Devin George. As amazing as that is, you don't want to miss the story later about his experience in Seattle and who possibly saved his career. He also played professionally in six countries. He's been an executive director and producer, including but not limited to podcasting called the official McCoy podcast available on YouTube, where he did an amazing episode, among others, a couple years ago, dedicated to the late and inspirational Nipsey Hussle and his business partner, Ray Young, talking about mental health and Ray's near-death experience. He is currently the president of Media 34, where he is not only an innovative creator of cultural relevant content that taps into the passions of conscious consumers, but he and his partners, Ray Young, Jocelyn Rose Lyons, and Matt Barnes, who are executive partners, hope to make inroads into the white technology and entertainment space and industry that is long overdue. Jelani's a shrewd businessman and mindful of how the black dollar is not only perceived, but spent and is actively engaged in mobilizing the shift by not only educating people, but putting his money where his mouth is in the black and brown communities. Mental health is an important issue for him as he has learned to manage his anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. One of his favorite moments was when he was guarding Hall of Famer Hakeem Olajuwon and as Hakeem was proceeding to make one of his several patented fakes before he would shoot Jelani stripped his ass and started the fast break. He shares a birthday with Giannis. You can find on Instagram at Jelani underscore McCoy underscore 34 and at Media 34 where he's the president. For real, uh, you know, I told KJ this and you guys, you know, the UCLA connection and, and uh, truly honored that you're joining us. But that's all the time we have for this show. Yeah, you know what I mean? Damn, man. Ten minute introduction. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in part. Star. Wait, wait. In, in your introduction, there's all kinds of stuff I want to hear about because I, I want to hear about the growth spurt and I want to hear about the skateboarding and I want to hear about Seattle. But do I understand that that today is both Pretzel Day and Cannabis Awareness Day on the same day? It's soft pretzel, stress awareness, and cannabis awareness month, not day, dumbass. You're always talking shit about me being an articulate listener and that I don't listen and all that, man. Get out of here. Hey, man, that's funny as hell because I'm actually a soft pretzel guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I am, and I do, I'm an advocate for cannabis, you know what I mean? So, that's right. hey, we pick, we got 23, you know what I mean? It's 23, that's Michael what? Jordan's number. It's a lot of good symbolism hey. going on. I don't think there are any non-advocates for <laughs> cannabis, are there? Yeah, I, I, there's, <laughs> believe it or not, there's still some out there. Well, you know, they're going to be swept over by the uh, uh, the tide, I believe. Without question. Real uh, it's a good thing that Doritos or uh, Peanut M&M's Day doesn't fall on Cannabis <laughs> Awareness Day because I'm not sure I'd be able to keep it all together. Nah, everybody, the other dudes will lose all their teeth. You know what I mean? You got to be careful with them, uh, them Peanut M&M's, man. You got to be careful. You might end up leaving with a chip. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of things chronicled. And, um, you know, you, you've certainly evolved on, on many fronts, as, as you heard in the intro a little bit. But... Um, you know, when you're in San Diego, going to a mostly white school, mm -hmm. um, talk about that experience and, and, and how, um, you sort of, 
reach back on those experiences to you know where you are now and and how that helped you uh, grow grow as a young adolescent uh well you know i, I came from the bay area so right I that's why i said of, sort of yeah 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 i moved in the fourth that was a good call who I, I moved in the fourth grade ironically going to saint augustine elementary before i moved down here and went to saint augustine high school so uh, this, the area I was in was very progressive. It wasn't like it was an all black area. You know what I mean? It was a, a, a upper middle class kind of, you know, Berkeley in the middle between the Berkeley and Oakland Hills. So there was a lot of, you know, there was black people, there was white people, there was Asians, you know, there, there was a mix. So it kind of helped me become a little bit more equipped by coming down to Saint, Saints at the time uh, in down here in North Park, San Diego. So I wasn't just at an all black school, not understanding how to, you know, to communicate with other races on campus, not understanding about tolerance, the way different people, different mood, the way they go about things and, and really understanding how some people, you know, were viewing black people at the time. So uh, at the time when I when I got there, at Saints, there was a whole for whatever reason, there were some kids from TJ. There were kids there. I wasn't the only kid from Southeast. You know what I mean? Uh, I wasn't there was just an influx of black and brown and Filipino at the school because it was expanding. So when I was there, there's a guy, Father John, rest in peace. One of the big reasons why I came there, he was like a savant, very eccentric priest. He was, he had OCD, was like mumble stuff to himself, would be talking about stuff that was relevant. You know, he's one of those dudes, you know what I mean? But just a, you know, a real blessed man. I, 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 I'll always say he should be up for sainthood, but when I was there, that was it was it was a no tolerance for that, for real. For who there was really no race issues, you know what I mean? Like you would come in there expecting, like you know, the white boys to be on what white boys are on at an all boys school, you know what I mean? Uh, but, but there was really no time for that there. Not that we seen on campus, but my, we might have been like like that because we was all big dudes. Daryl was there; he was a big dude, six four, six five. All the dudes, you know, the, a lot of the athletes. But uh, I, I think either we were just so galvanized by each other being there and just being together there with together that we ignored it or it didn't matter, but we didn't really have any problems uh, on the campus as far as race issues. That's fascinating because uh, <clears throat> I talk about this all the time. I went to a Jewish day school for the first mm -hmm. four years of my life. And then in fifth grade, you know, I was uh, introduced to public school and it changed my life forever. And uh, same thing. I, I, the integration was natural. I didn't, I can't say that I didn't see anything, but um, it was uh, it changed my life, you know, forever. And uh, yeah. so grateful for that experience. I saw some ignorant stuff, but it wasn't outright. It was just like they don't know no better, man. It's like you know they ask some stupid ass questions about you know, hey man, is you know guys coming up to you, you know, asking the silly questions that they don't know nothing about that might be offensive. And you just like, dude, they don't know any better. It ain't no big deal. You just like answer mm -hmm. the question, nah, bro. We all, you know, he got a dad, you know what I mean? He got a dad, you know, he got a dad, you know what I mean? We all, we all got dad. We aren't just all, you know what I mean? Single parent moms or whatever's going on. So there'd be more questions like that where people would ask or, you know, they ask about music or why we do this or why we wear that. But that was pretty much the extent of it. Plus, I don't play that shit anyway. I don't, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, for real. Yeah, growing your temper, up in Oakland, yeah. yeah, growing up in Oakland, my mom's hot tempered. You know what I mean? I grew up there coming up in the 70s in Oakland on the hills, all the Panther stuff. So I grew up in East Oakland before I moved. So uh, I was I was already woke by the time that, I, you know what I mean? I got to sing. So that was that was one of the main things I buy with Father John, too, because he let me be woke and, 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 and you know, and just vibe about I wasn't Catholic. I was Baptist, you know what I mean, the whole nine. So it was very tolerant, you know what I mean, of those things that let me just grow up there. I, I found public school to be very a very similar experience for me. I didn't I didn't go to parochial schools of any sort. I did, but, yeah. But when I went to but when I went to public school, it was two years post race riot. And and in Seattle, I don't know how familiar you are with the high schools, but Garfield and Rainier yep. Beach mm -hmm. were were historically black high schools. Mm -hmm. And I, I was at Lincoln across town and, and there were there were two years before I was, a, I guess, a sophomore. But I, I was in the I was in the morning breakfast program. And so I'd Ooh. be at school early. Yeah, says a lot about my background, but, <laughs> but I'd be at school early at, when all the buses would show up. So so that's when all the the minority kids would would come to campus and we'd hang out in the lunchroom before the bell. 
And so public school for me was sort of my, yeah. uh, my melting pot, if you will. Yeah. I went to, I, I convinced my parents to let me go to public school in the middle of my parochial school experience, I think in like seventh or eighth grade. And they sent me to Gompers. And if you're wow. from San Diego, if you're from San Diego, you know, Gompers Ooh. is like Beirut. You know what I mean? This is like uh, 93, <laughs> 94, 95, you know, whatever it was, like in my little eighth grade pocket. But Gompers was wild. You know what I mean? Wild. It was like a movie. Like you couldn't, it was like, uh, what was that? Fair East Side and- uh, Oh, in Jersey? Yeah. yeah. Uh, lean on me. Lean on me. Lean on me type shit. Big ass security guards, yeah, damn near was... police officers, locking the gates, shooting at the PE times, you know what I mean? And I came back, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna come back and run with the uniforms and go back to the parochial <laughs> shit because, you know what I mean? They're, they're tripping up here, man. Uh, I want to follow up with something. Rashawn, you can jump in anytime. Let me follow up with something that I found very interesting I want to ask you about because I'm a part of this um, Coaches for Racial Equality here in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Father John, back then, uh, being such a forward thinker and allowing you, like you said, to be woke and, and be comfortable in your own skin, mm -hmm. instead of uh, either um, indirectly or directly asking you to assimil assimilate or acculturate into the mainstream, Mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, mad props to him. But Jeff Harper, uh, coach of Lincoln High School here, I don't know if you know Harp, but, you know, his brother was shot in a gang a long time ago. He played at Cincinnati, and he's, mm -hmm. um, you know, the head coach of the, uh, of the boys here, and it's the only high school in San Diego that has a, a gang terminology in its name, right, Lincoln, Lincoln Park. And yeah. so he talked about uh, during the meeting um, two days ago, but how the kids uh, during the Derek Chauvin uh, trial, uh, mm. they didn't really care about it. And the way, the reason I'm asking this question is because we're talking about your high school days mm. and a lot of the kids nowadays, I think they're aware of what's going on, but to, in his words, he said, they don't give a shit. Like, how is that helping my uncle? How my uncle's in jail for weed or, you know, so I, how, how do we as white, white guy, you know, Rashawn obviously is not white, but Gordon and I are white and, and we both coach high school ball. You know, mm -hmm. he coaches boys. I coach girls. I coach college ball a long time. And so did Gordon. And, but how, how do, what do we say, how, how are we supposed to grapple with those types of issues when there's not necessarily apathy, but understandably so that they don't care about shit like that? Like, it, how does that help them? And, and is that going to change down the road? Well, I don't think they had to live with that anymore. That's not, hasn't been their burden. I think when me and Rashawn grew up, you know what I mean? A lot of people in the community, a lot of athletes made those sacrifices and, and did so much great work, even behind the scenes that people are just now finding out when people pass away and you hear these articles about, oh, he did this and he had this and he set up this and he actually did this and he was secretly behind this. I think that led for a headway in a generation of kids who really just had to show up at the end of the day and be the best athletes that could be entertainers, you know, wherever it was that, you know what I mean? The kids in our communities are, you can find headway in and make money. You need find ways to get to a, a better education, but I, 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 they're so consumed with social media and so many other things and have so many anxieties about their, their, their presence that, you know what I mean? And like I said, the, the such great work was done before them. I think there was basically a window where they didn't know they didn't give a shit, you know what I mean? It was, uh, 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 it had, like they said, uh, they got an uncle who's really going through something. So all the, the, the outreach and the, the conversations, like black people get tired of having the conversation, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to know, hey man, let's sit down and figure out how we can understand or how we can help you guys. And you're like, man, you know, they, they did that shit in the nineties. You know, we was doing that shit with Reagan and Bush and you know what I mean? Those was conversations. And those were long overdue, you know what I mean? So I think everybody's just burnt out now, man. It's been in yeah. everybody's face 24-7, 365, right? The youngsters, the young guys aren't in school. They're in virtual schools. They can't see nobody. They can't hoop, you know what I mean? They can't do any of the things that they were accustomed to. So I think a little bit of it is just a burnout of what's going on and them detaching it because they don't have the emotional intelligence that we have as adults. And I even think, uh, Rashawn can speak to this uh, too. I even think of a lot of adults, players, guys that, you know what I mean, played at went to the D1 schools and came from different backgrounds, burnt out because they try to figure out different ways to talk to the young people 
manage their families, their kids' questions, their spouse questions. You know what I mean? I'm in an inter- uh My wife is half Japanese, half Jewish. So, you know what I mean? She has questions on how to raise our two kids. So people are just burnt out at the end of the, uh, at the end of the day. And I think, you know what I mean? You have to have people in there who can be moved quick and make decisions and then able to teach and able to pivot with the times and not based, you know what I mean? Not based on old academia or old ways that they used to have conversations. It's really about what can you do to affect somebody's life like now on a day-to-day basis without having to meet with them every week and them and so that you can pull out of them the solution. It's not up to black people for the solution anymore. It's never really been, you know what I mean? And now at a certain time, that's why Loco got a little antsy with you. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you know what I mean, he, you know, he's at a point, you know, where it's kind of like nobody who really can articulate it, they're tired of articulating it that no more. They just want to fall back and say, it is what it is, man. Y'all, y'all feel how y'all want to feel, you know what I mean, and now, because you can just turn on the TV and see what it is. So, you know, I just attribute it to burnout and, and, and just people, you know, on a raw nerve. Well, nobody's listened to old people any, anyway. I mean, yeah. when I was a kid, we didn't listen That's to the cool. older generation and the generation yeah. after me, they didn't, you, you have a, a, a small window where you can actually have have that, uh, I'm going to call it a cross generational dialogue, but that's probably go. not not the best term. But like, unless you're Michael or Dr. J, like you know, I, I my assistant coach wears he's from Atlanta and he wear, wears a baseball cap to practice, and I turned to him and I asked him for comments yesterday and I called him Dave Justice. And then I realized there isn't anybody in the gym who knows who Dave Justice is, Justice is. except for him and me. You should have came with Freddie Freeman, man. You should have come with Freddie right. Freeman. I, but I, but I, I, I'm, I'm out. You know, like I, I, I realized that we quickly become our own grandfather without even realizing we've got there one day. I'm walking around in a, in a white tank top it, with my slippers on and the language that I'm using is not a language that anybody can relate to anymore because nobody told me that yeah. you don't say these things anymore. Yeah. And yeah. they're innocent and innocuous. You know, I said to my kids, I said, I'm tickled to be here. I said, uh, uh, you can't tickle anybody. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. no, that's not, you know what, <laughs> what I mean? Like, fuck, like yeah, if somebody, yeah. if you're not hanging and around. No tickling going on in here, coach. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, they don't know who Akeem Olajuwon is or Dikembe Mutombo, except for yeah. now he's in a commercial, right? I mean, this is the yeah. only way that they – and and so, you know, like, how, how do they get reached? They get reached peer-to-peer. Yep. Yep. So um, I, I, got a, I got a question for you, Jelan. You know, just because being on – you know, obviously growing up on the West Coast and me, I grew up on the East Coast, um, you know, I remember back in, like, 92 – when you know, obviously hip hop was at the at the height of, of coming around, and then West Coast music started to really jump into the forefront of hip hop at the time. How did music affect your development as a youth, um, and 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 how did it shape the, the growth of you as a person? You know, um, and 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 how much of it did you listen to? Because I know, be growing up in the East Coast, hip hop was a, a way of life for us, yep. and then. West Coast, I know it was a way of life because that's what they rapped about. How did that influence you, Ron? Great question. It was heavy, Rashawn, heavy, heavy, just like you. You know what I mean? It, 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 it was during the workout, during walk to you know, school, everything. It was just, it, it spoke to us, you know what I mean? It spoke to the, to the things that we were seeing. And, you know what I mean? It was in, you know, it was in, unfortunately, you know, you grew up in some of the neighborhoods and been around. It was in the languages that we were using. You know what I mean? It's kind of a secret code, too. You know what I mean? Back then, hip hop was secret code. So, you know what I mean? You can be singing something with the homies or being a cypher or something. You know, it was almost therapeutic because nobody knew what, you know what I mean, a do rag was or, you know what I mean, what Tim signified or out here on the West Coast, what Chuck's, what Chuck signified, what, you know what I mean, rag signified, six fours, everything that you were seeing. You know what I mean? They were putting in the music in like real time. You know what I mean? Uh, all the all this, uh, stuff that was happening in the neighborhoods, the police brutality, even down to having fun. You know what I mean? A lot of people forget. I think that's what. Uh, uh, so yeah, talk about your uh, interview with uh, DJ Quick that uh, 
you just had and what you guys were discussing. What we were talking about was I asked him what makes his music different than other gangster rap. He said he made music because he was tired of seeing all his friends dying and he wanted to see, so hear some shit where people have fun because we have a lot of fun on the West Coast. We got great weather, there's beaches, barbecues, clubs, you know what I mean, whatever it is. So um, I, I, it was a big part of my life. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I at one point used to write rhymes just like everybody else, you know what I mean? We all try uh, that. Listen to, yeah, <laughs> listen to beats, you know what I mean? I've always been into producing and, and like not only the lyrics, but the samples and you know what I mean? The drum patterns and all that. So I used to, I used to try to do all that stuff to the best of my abilities. Um, but uh, it, West Coast uh, basketball and West Coast music, I think go hand in hand because I think out here on the West Coast for whatever reason, the ball players and the and the uh, and the uh, the rappers are entertainers. We're hanging out. It's, it's Hollywood, so you know what I mean. They're mid co mingling a lot more. Uh, I haven't been on the East Coast, but it, it seems to me like they co mingle a lot more on the West Coast. So it was just a thing that we just always had to vibe to. Music was a big part of my life and my game. So that's what it, that's what timing was. So I, I have a question transitioning to UCLA. Uh, yep. because uh, I, I heard some interesting things you and Ray talk about. Um, and, you know, obviously they were coming off a fresh uh, national championship. And, um, you know, the culture of college campuses is something that we've talked about on this show and how that's possibly shifting where either um, players might go to HBCs or mm -hmm. they're, they're looking at different considerations when, when choosing campuses, you know, the life off the court. And so, um, you know, there were some, some things, you know, sort of unwritten rules or things that happened at UCLA that, you know, mm. not everybody necessarily knew about, you know, you went to UCLA because, or, you know, and obviously you were suspended for some bullshit, um, mm -hmm. you know, stuff that happened in the summertime that was just weak. Um, really yeah. And yeah. so, so from that standpoint, how was, how, how have you seen that experience when you were there versus what, what coach Cronin's doing now? And do you think that, that the, the coaches have paid attention and, and helped with that evolution? I mean, first of all, don't get it twisted. If coach Eric remains in UCLA, coach Eric probably retires in the same lights of the Dean Smiths and, and, the, and the Roy Williams of the world. He coach K you know what I mean? Uh, uh, and that it was a fault only because Coach, Coach Herrick protected his players. So uh, Coach Herrick really established, you know what I mean, was the closest thing to Wooden as, a, as, as far as the UCLA tradition for, for, for coaches. It's not even close. You know what I mean? We're a basketball IQ off the charts. Uh, the way we went about our seasons, highly conditioned, highly information. I'm talking about <clears> – <throat> Uh, uh, before the before every practice and breaking out a whiteboard, talk doing uh, saying how many threes we shot, how many threes we made, how many offensive rebounds we got, and like doing analytics before practices, doing visual things without the ball, breaking out in the lines. So he had a lot of similarities as I actually actually Phil Jackson without the Zen shit. You know calmness, I mean? was, you know, calmness, <laughs> you know, more, you know what I mean, with things without the ball, muscle memory, you know what I mean, uh, th having the people do things together and synchronic, you know, synchronic, synchronic. So everybody's just moving as one, and you can do things blindly and just feeling out everything's moved. So uh, Coach Eric would have retired uh, up there, been up there with, with John Wood and hanging up banners who would have been in the final four every year, wow. you know what I mean? It would have been discussing of course Eric would have remained there. Uh, that being said, there wasn't a vibe at UCLA to me after Coach Eric. Lab had a vibe. Lab had a vibe, you know what I mean? Uh, continued picked up where Coach Eric left off to the good drive of recruiting. Um, uh, had, some great, had some great runs in the tournament. Got out of the way of the talent. Lab did a good job of getting out of the way of the talent, not blocking yeah. anybody. Uh, letting people rock out, you know what I mean? If you can rock out or, you know, uh, you know, be about with the lab system, you know, you pretty much let you do what you want to do. I think after that, it was kind of blah, blah, blah. I didn't really watch the games. There was no identity to the teams. A couple of players came and went, you know, the uh, one and dones. That's cool. You know what I mean? That keeps our NBA number up uh, when, you, when, when you look it up. But I think- Very, Coach very bland, right? Very bland. Yeah, very super bland, super bland. Really nothing, you know what I mean? I went to a couple of practices. There's nothing to get excited about. 
I lucked up with Lonzo, you know what I mean? Keeping Lonzo in there and having the Lonzo train. But I think what Coach Tony has done is he's uh, established an identity. Then he got them, he got them guys out there playing like they had a mid-major, you know what I mean? Practicing hard, taking every position the same, getting away of that UCLA soft press. You know, everybody talks about how UCLA does everything so lackadaisical and it's so chill, which it kind of got back to when uh, – What's the guy's name that was there? Alfred. Alfred was just, to me, he was just so detached from, you know what I mean? And you can't bring an Indiana guy over to the West Coast and hand him the keys to Westwood. You know, so I never stupid. really understood Go it. gently. Go gently. Go gently it on the IU. <laughs> This is what we got, you know. What I mean, if so many other. No, but I, I think you, I think you make a, you make a very good point about. Um, What's the what's the right word? I mean, I, fit doesn't really doesn't really do it, but but there but but maybe resonance, you know, maybe yeah. maybe you you said vibe. I, I would say you know symbolism it, is it, yeah. Is the is yeah. the is the school or the student athletes you know vibrating at the same rate as, as the guy that's directing or guys that yeah. are directing them? And I I, I didn't I and didn't see that. And it frequency, sounds like frequency is a good word. And and Jelani, you, you, you felt that with coach Herrick. Oh, everybody did. I mean, you know what? A lot of people don't like coach Herrick because a lot of those guys got their spot taken because he was another (laughs) dude who didn't block talent. You know what I mean? If you can rock, you're going to rock. You know what I mean? He's going to put a lot on you. He's going to push you. You know what I mean? But you're going to get a chance to rock. So you'll find a lot of guys that don't like coach Herrick because they might've got their spot took in the Fresh might have to play a little bit more minutes, but you know, I mean, that's another reason why I like Coach Herrick. You know, he's a guy like Bobby Bowden in football. You know, Bobby Bowden, if he can play freshman, whatever it is, we're gonna put you out there. We're gonna start you, whatever it is. Coach Fisher over at Michigan, those are the type of guys. You know, what I mean, frequencies that I like. You can go play as a freshman. You know what I mean, uh, uh, and still have an opportunity. You know, to play for championships because that's what it's about at UCLA. But back to Cronin, I think he's got them. With an identity, you're going to come here, you're going to play. You're not going to – I know he's big on not renting the four letters. I heard him say that at a couple of luncheons that we had pre-COVID. So I think he uh, uh, he's going to stick to his guns. I think his staff is going to stick to their guns. they got a lot of resources up there. They got rid of that funky-ass Under Armour contract. Finally got it, you know. <laughs> they should have they waited. They should have waited. Nah, I think they're going to be straight because they went to the Final Four. They was already doing it wrong. Yeah, but he imagine how too. much leverage they'd have had if they had, had just come out of the Final Four and now all of a sudden everybody wants to – that contract would have would have had a little boost. It would. It hey, would. Uh, Hopefully, uh, also, it also too, something. you got – you got you got some Jersey City flavor on that staff. Darren Zafino, he went to St. Anthony's too. He's on that on Cronin staff. See, so, they're very they're know. very regimented over there, Sean. They don't mess around yeah. in practice. They're very St. Anthony's. played at St. Anthony's, yeah, yeah, as well. I remember those practices. I remember I was like, man, this shit ain't nothing like that. Right, right, man, man. <laughs> yeah. These boys are practice <laughs> practicing. <laughs> shit, man, they got we, drills. School, we had the two days. We had, man, we was out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Everybody. Jelani, did you, did you see them practicing at, at, at White Eagle or just out on the West Coast? Uh, they actually saw him play actress at Torrey Pines. I practiced with him. It was the weirdest thing. You know what I mean? I was like, uh, my, I told, like I was, I was speaking before with Rashawn, my mentor and Coach Hurley were close. So, uh, and I was in season, you know, and they were playing in the above the rim tournament. Above the rim. And yeah. whatever reason, they were like, they were like, go out there and practice. I'm like, you can't do that. I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, they're, in the middle, they're about to play in the above the rim tournament. I'm playing in a whole nother high school, bro. I can't go out here and practice with it, man. They were like, okay, get out there. And I remember everybody came like with an attitude. I remember Jadil <laughs> Roberts looking at me like, who's this big skinny, not me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Rashawn was just in his bag, professional being sweet over there in the drills, <laughs> being smooth and shit. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, he cold. You know what I mean? No, yeah, he going to do it. I was like, oh, okay, he cold. Yeah, I, I get it. You know what I mean? But, you know, I was down there with the big dudes battling the bigs. But, you know what I mean? That's, that was my, that's how I met Rashawn. But that shit was, like every station was detailed. Your shirt tail was in. Everybody was built a little bit. It wasn't like I oh, was, we we, know, we lifted four no days a week. Room. Yeah, we we lifted four yeah, days a week. Yeah, we didn't have we had a weight. <laughs> we wasn't like that. Yeah, you know, I'm talking we, about in the off in the off season. We lifted. We even lifted during the off season, man. We would go straight from school 
to the to the gym to lift and so we didn't have a you know a gym gym so we would yeah. we had this thing called the nautilus fitness center as a former fireman and him and his wife had it so we went to their facility and they would train us and you know fitness and then we would go to practice from there <laughs> now that makes sense i was like this is this because I, I was just like is this just a jersey thing and, and our, fr- and our freshman did? our freshman jv and varsity teams followed the same red <laughs> yeah so y'all it was a machine let yeah, me ask was, you guys a, a yeah it was a machine let me ask you guys a follow-up question and then we'll, we'll transition to the the paul westfall and detlef shrimp stuff and and how that helped mm-hmm. you uh, you know, sort of change your perspective on things. And I asked uh, Matt Doherty, who was on the show, sorry to both of you, Carolina guy, anyways, <laughs> about the four letters uh, on the front of the jersey, right? Um, Carolina's three, but UCLA is four, Duke's four. Um, but I'm more interested in the brotherhood. And we'll talk about mental health down the road, because I know, Jelani, you guys have a, a group chat that you guys now have to, you know, look out for each other. You know, mm-hmm. mental health isn't necessarily something that's taboo as much anymore, but it still is on some level. But but talk about the brotherhood, at whether it's Duke or UCLA and, and, and how you didn't realize that going in and and how now you're so glad that you were a part of what you were a part of, because it's something that you'll carry with you forever. And it's 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 um, you can't put a price tag on it. Yeah, I think our started because we was jealous of Duke's. <laughs> for real, for real. You know what I mean? They got the commercials, they got the Nike drops, the Duke Brotherhood shit all over Instagram. They got their own sneakers, they got their camps, they bring the players back to, you know what I mean? Our started at like, you know what I mean? Like, damn, man, how you know the North Carolina Duke tree, man? I, sh- I should have rethought that shit because that shit right there is a player. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, seeing players on the staff. Duke and, you know, Duke and North Carolina Planners on the staff, you know what I mean? You don't really see that at UCLA, you know what I mean? I think ours started at, like, like let's just, like, ours was rogue. UCLA don't have the best alumni situation. You don't really hear Reggie Miller talking about UCLA, you know what I mean? There's, you know, there's Tracy Dez, but a lot of the superstars and a lot of the big-name players – you don't really hear him talking about UCLA. Yeah, but you can't Brown. get Bill Walton to shut up about it. I mean, he, <laughs> but he, 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 he he's, he's like 10 guys in. talking about it. Yeah, he got to dial in. He got to account for at least 10 Bruins. You know what I mean? So at least somebody, <laughs> Bill's going to be there to hold it down. But, uh, yeah, our start, ours was rogue, man. You know, we got some complaints from, uh, from the AD and UCLA about some of the stuff we were saying on social media we made a big push for Earl Watson to get the job and they actually like told us, you know, shut up low key. And if wow. we kept carrying on, like we wasn't going to be the, you know, wasn't going to be so friendly when we come to the games, you know what I mean? And yada, yada, wow. yada. So, yeah. That's so crazy. we, we kind of went rogue, you know what wow. I mean? Uh, said and did a couple of things on social, social media, uh, did a lot of work for Earl. We were obviously offering all the resources to Earl from even from uh, getting Steph Curry had signed off on a special UCLA shoe. Wow. You know what I mean? But who wow. wasn't going to do that unless Earl and them was Earl in there. Was you know, we had the whole thing. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Yada, yada, yada. So uh, we ain't re- we wasn't really tripping. We, we didn't really just want it to be you know, in consideration. We know we it really in here in the city. Got AU coaches, high school coaches. You know what I mean? Uh, I was involved in AU in high school and doing broadcasting and coaching. So uh, uh, we just wanted to, you know, be taken seriously like the Dukes in North Carolina uh, Brotherhood. So uh, mm-hmm. I would just say that ours actually started rogue and maybe halfway is still rogue. <laughs> Some of us in and out with <laughs> very outspoken people uh, in, in our group, you know what I mean? So I'll let Rashawn take it. But ours has started out of spite and jealousy. That was our, the question. <laughs> you know, it, it, it ended up being one of the most positive things that could ever happen out of a night. Well, I'm, mine is uh, Duke is a little different because I grew up in the Hurley family, so I kind of knew it from the beginning. Right. Um, but we had it in high school, like in our summer at White Eagle, all of our Darren Savino, Jared King, Mandy Johnson, all the guys who were stars, Terry DeHair, Jerry Walker, all these guys came mm-hmm. back and played with us, and they they were all from Jersey City. So we I had a brotherhood like that growing up in high school. So it was, I mean, Duke was a natural progression because it's like. Uh, 
we, we were already familiar with the, the older generation coming in, dropping that knowledge on a regular and then playing in the summertime, picking up little tools of guys that played in the league from a high school and that's, that's in college currently. And it gave us the confidence that we all could do it. I mean, yeah. I, you know, we had 14, you know, division one players on my high school team, yeah. you know? And so, um, you know, when I got to Duke, it, it was a natural shift because it, that was already being done. Um, and, and the thing that's rare uh, is obviously coach is one of the few coaches, you know, in, in his one and probably only job as a head coach, he's still there. Like coaches just yeah. aren't at their institutions long enough to be able to create something like that. And the schools don't do a good job because other sports may get jealous. You know, yeah. they can't feel like, uh, you know, oh, well, football don't have it. So basketball shouldn't have it or whatever. Coach created that, you know, yeah. the atmosphere of bringing and, you know, bringing former players back. And when we go and, and the networking events that he has with his camp, I yeah. mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's $5 billion at this camp yeah. <laughs> in total. And yeah. for us to be able to mingle and, and talk business and, and meet people that we wouldn't normally see from Apple and Glencorp and all these other, you know, energy companies and, be able to understand how to invest and, and put, you know, put money well, even into the K uh, Academy, right? Rashad, right, even the K Academy guys would come in and, yeah, and drop 10 K to come and do fantasy camp there. Right. And, and they, coach they is there for us to yell at them. Right. For us to right, right, right. right. But, but coach is there and there's a draft. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 uh, bias aside and, and my bias is, is an IU bias, or at least it used to be not anymore so much, but you know, you know, there's, there's, it seems like there's a level of excellence uh, and then there's another level of excellence. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, yeah. that, th- that and loyalty mm-hmm. really doesn't exist anymore. Guy, mm-hmm. Guys don't, right. guys don't want to stay and do things a you certain way. And I was just talking to Mike before we got on about, you know, uh, stealing money and not, right. not, not really doing all the work that's involved. There's a lot of hats you wear if you want to be a basketball coach and sure. some guys are willing to wear two, but not 20. True. That's true. So true. You're listening to part one of this incredible interview with Jelani McCoy with special guest host Rashawn McLeod, who was on the podcast previously. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to that two part interview, I encourage you to do so. It was fascinating as well. And we also have Coach K back with us in the sports deli, one of our original hosts joining us today. And we appreciate you joining us, give you a chance to go refill your favorite beverage as we continue with this last segment with Jelani McCoy in part one of this two-part interview right here on the Sports Deli. I want to fast forward a little bit, um, be sensitive to time, but so the way I want to frame this is um, and you share you know, with us whatever you want to share mm-hmm. in terms of a learning experience and, and in terms of what debt left did for you and, and how that changed your mindset and someone advocating for you and moving forward uh, to the rest of your career and, and, and being on the roster and playing with hall of famers, mm-hmm. you know, so talk about sort of that, that road uh, to get to the Lakers and, and how that initial experience surprised you about yeah. Paul Westfall. And then, uh, you know, that's not even an old school kind of mentality. That's just, you know, ridiculous. That's a buster. Rest in peace. Paul Westfall was a yeah. fucking buster. Excuse my French. You know what it's I mean? Uh, and, and Mike, Mike, you should you should preface this by saying, you know, you're taught you're asking about Detlef Shrimp. Yeah. The 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 center for the Sonics at the time you were power drafted, forward, right? power forward, small forward, small forward, power forward, you know. Right. Sort of the the uh, the precursor to uh, uh, yeah the, the 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 stretch four the, yeah the, stretch the, the, four, the yeah. euro the euro stretch the euro four stretch really four. yeah 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 Dur- um, the the first Dirk Nowitzki there you go without all the wiggle and because yeah. <laughs> <shit. laughs> yeah. he, he was a rugged dude call. man that that's he was a rugged dude man yeah, yeah. so yeah. Jelani yeah. what what yeah. what year was this you would you would come to Seattle 98, was, 98. and Paul fell was in the draft fell in okay. the draft. I was supposed to go a lot of fell all the way to 33 you know what I mean watch the all the you know a couple of people go in front of me that probably should have you know what I mean after going through all that UCLA stuff um did every workout did the whole thing I did I, I could do do I did so many workouts and interviews yeah I did about 18 marijuana. man 
And you know what I mean? Uh, you think you had a drug habit? You know, yada yada yada. How, how, how do you, you know what I mean? Got it. Pre pre what cannabis knowing the information of what cannabis does to people uh, now. I didn't always have the best attitude about it. You know what I mean? Some of these uh, in some of these interviews because I was still kind of star. But I it was ninety eight drafted by the Sonics. Um, uh, I went to like one of the very first practices. I was killing. And this is a veteran laden team, you know what I mean? I uh, just came GP. from George Carl, GP, uh, um, Hersey Hawkins. Wow. Uh, Sean Kemp on that team? No, nah, they made the trade for Vin Baker. You know okay. what I mean? So, but this was called Vin Baker. This is before arguing. Vin Baker had his issues. This was yeah. still the lie, the, the Olympic, you know what I mean? This, so he was still the man of 100 moves. Don't forget how cold Vin Baker was before, you know what I mean? Life yeah. hit him. And, and Paul shout, Westfall shout was out. the coach at the time? Yeah, man. He was like one of the – so, yeah, I had one of the greatest practices ever. And Paul Westfall ridicules me, stops to practice in the middle of the scrimmage when I'm killing and doing everything you can literally do on a basketball court. Three-pointers, because uh, I, I was so much uh, was shooting with uh, uh, Phil Weber, who used to be a, a coach for the yeah, Sun. Yeah. So. I was like, I had, I had hand over Sean, I had the Rashawn jumper, I had range, you know, I had my hops, both legs, wrong leg, you know what I mean? I had the full package. I'm out here throwing dimes. I've always been a gifted passer. I was, it's, it's getting ridiculous that they're literally, Billy Owens, one of my favorite players, is like, like giving me the ball, like, no, nah, no, nah, just something else. Like, no, nah, you bring it up. <laughs> I'm bringing it, I'm giving it to him, like thinking, you know, I'm gonna give it to Billy Owens. He bring it up. I'm sprinting up the court, do my little power forward thing. And he's like, nah, you bring it up. And I think that was the thing that triggered Paul Westfall wow. to do the bullshit, right? Because he stopped the scrimmage. Uh, he brings us all in, gets us real close, and he puts on this weird smile. I don't know if you've seen the Paul Westfall smile. If you go back to the things and, he's, and he does when he's talking to the referees, and he's got that ishy, shitty grin on his face, the Westfall, rest in peace, shitty grin. <laughs> it's kind of like, eh. It's kind of like playing to the crowd, you know what I mean? It's just a little Westfall thing. So he's putting on this Westfall. It's insincere at, at very least. Yeah, yeah, it's very WWE-ish. Like he's a WWE <laughs> man. You know, and whatever. Like, you know, so, uh, so he puts that on. He's like, grabs the ball. He's like, why is he dominating practice with NBA players on? And then he's like, why is he blocking shots? Why is he out here shooting jumpers? Right? And then he's like, then he's like, and why is he? And he kind of like clips me. Then he like clips me, you know what I mean? Because he's pointing to where the baseline is like, why is he bringing the ball up? And I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there on my head down, like, what the fuck is going on right now? Right. And and then, you know, then he did the touch thing. And I'm like, I'm totally not okay with this dude in here. He's already killing me. So why is he touching on me? You know, you know what I mean? So uh he's like, uh scrimmage is over. Scrimmage is over. Everybody go to a basket, shoot free throws. <laughs> God damn. Right, They're actually, pretty good. That, that, yeah, that dumbass yeah, smirk. Right, right, right. So was he Jelani? Was he ripping you, or was he ripping them? I don't know what he was doing at this point, Gordon. But all I know, the steam from me, myself, and Irene, and all the cartoon, the <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm talking about top, literally about to just pop out. I'm black. I'm like, it's over, bro. I man, you know what I mean. I tried that, or they just not want me to play in the NBA. I went through the UCLA stuff. Now this, I'm like, it's over, right? Literally, I don't know. I wasn't gonna go spree well, but you know what I mean. I was gonna, I was gonna bark. You know what I mean. I was gonna definitely. I was, de hey man, you know. Mm. So uh, right when that's about to happen, uh, I'm about to go to my little basket. He, he puts his hand on me again. I see the little hand turn around. Not you. You take this ball and you dribble around everybody while they're shooting free throws. Wow. I said, bro, this is, you have got to be kidding me. This is the NBA? 
this is the thing that I grew up for. I just had, you already just stripped me of my moment. Now you just want to pound me just down into the ground real nasty. Like, so at this wow. point, I take a step to him because, you know, I, at this point, I done lost it. Then dead left shrimp gets in the middle of us. Boop, all of a sudden, dead left shrimp appear. Boop. I'll run with you. And I'm like, oh. what? And then I'm like, well, you know, like, move, daddy. You know what I mean? I'm about, you know, he was like, he was like, no, I'm gonna run with you. So he take off running. You know, they brings me in, he brought blocks, whatever happened. So me and he was like, I'm about to take off running. I don't know if you, I think his name is Steve Gordon, hat man. He used to work with shooting coach for the Sonics many years. Uh, he well, he starts walking yeah, with Yeah, he's us. the one that got that got messed up with Vollmer here and wound up in the newspaper and wound up see? in court. Yeah, didn't, yeah, didn't go see? very well for him. Yeah, see? So hat man and me and daddy are well, peeling off to run. And then what lost like, Dad, left. what are you doing? I told you to go to the basket and shoot free throws. Dead left turned around and gave this dude the coldest death stare I've ever seen in my life. And I kind of like, I was like, oh, shit. You know, <laughs> I was like, I don't see some cold ass looks, but that's a cold one. And then Daddy ended that's up right. running with me, dribbling the ball. He was like, trust me, kid, you talented. I wish I could do half the stuff you can do. If you keep working, you know what I mean? I'll mentor you. I got you. I'll teach you where I know you'll be here longer than he'll be. And you, you know what I mean? You just need to outlast him. He's not going to be here that long, which he wasn't. You know what I mean? Because he did some other racist borderline shit in a, in a meeting after we lost four games. And uh, that was like my introduction into the NBA. That was literally my introduction into the NBA. Wow. Wow. I, I would wow. be surprised GP would stand for any of that shit. Oh, he didn't stand for G the other there. stuff. G wasn't there. G was, okay. for whatever reason, G wasn't there, but G was there when he called us spear chuckers. You Maybe know? it was just practice. So wow. yes, G didn't practice a lot, unless, <laughs> unless he needed it. Yeah. yeah. Not D, and they, now you and know they, that, and they got on Allen Iverson for not practicing. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was. That's what yeah. I was yeah. Yeah. Jelani, you know, you know, Westfall was recruited by UCLA, but decided to go to USC. You know that, right? I didn't know he went to USC. Okay. I, so, yeah. so did did that factor in 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 your calculations at the time or no? I just thought he was a D, man. I'm like, yeah. this dude's a dick, bro. You might be a little. And then I had my antennas up. And then after that, so I was like, was this some? Nah, they're not. On this show, you can say dick, I think. <laughs> they don't let the racist motherfuckers run no teams, are they? You know what I mean? I thought, not in the NBA. All these black dudes up here, you know what I mean? They let white, they let white dudes get this shit off. I was like, couldn't be. It was just, you know, some hate on me for whatever reason. Mm. Yada, yada, yada. But he later slipped up and did some bullshit called us spear chuckers. And oh. then ended up getting fired like seven days later. Oh yeah, wow. GP was not having that that situation. He lost his. That's mind when he, on that's that. when G that's when G woke up for sure, for sure. You know what I mean? Because I was sitting there. Well, I'll tell you guys real quick. We were at we had just lost four or five games. He caught us in, sat us down on the little bleachers in a little practice facility. He was trying to galvanize the troops, right? <laughs> he put on his little silly ass smile again. You know, I remember GP. You know, GP bite his nail. He's the <laughs> so he was sitting down. You know, halfway listening. Ben was kind of spaced out, you know what I mean? Everybody was just like halfway listening to the dude. And I'm, and then he was like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you guys go into battle, you know, and you guys are in the jungle and you got your spears. And I was Shit. like, I knew it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right, right. I, I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And I turned and looked around and everybody was still like halfway paying attention. And then G like snapped out of it. He was like, Hold up. Did this mother just call us spear chuckers? And I was like, yes, he did, bro. I, I was like, thank Jesus. I thought you was actually going to let this shit go, and this was normal. And then Ben kind of snapped out of it and was like, nah, nah, no, he didn't. And then everybody like kind of snapped out of it. And then GP was like, don't even worry about it. I'm going to this motherfucker out here and about it. Don't even about it. In about five, seven days, don't even worry about it. True to, true to his word, in about five, seven days, he had got fired. Wally Walker, the GM that year? Wally Walker was the GM. I know my but Sonics. You do. Yeah, but that was the, that. was that. That was like my little – those three years in Seattle were rough, man. It was ghetto. We was out there thugging it out. Uh, 
the paint, the plane was the, the engine went out on the plane one time, you know what I mean? And the oh, beautiful boy. plane we had, it was all kind of stuff that would happen. And you know, Seattle was known as a veteran team, do seven, eight years, nine in the league. You can't play in your first year. So it was hard to crack the lineup. I did get a Man, chance to start. You tell him. Oh. Yeah, I did get a chance to start, you know what I mean? Playing some playoff games, uh, play alongside GP. I got started alongside Patrick Ewing. I started alongside Horace Grant. Uh, you know what I mean, Rashard Lewis, you know what I mean? So I got to play a lot of minutes. Uh, he still tried to throw me uh, under the fire in there. Actually, I got more playing times because he was trying to embarrass me and he tried to put me on Kendall Gill when Kendall Gill was in there. So I ended up having to guard Kendall Gill. He was playing like the two or the three. And he did it, I believe, to try to embarrass me, but I ended up locking Kendall up. So then they figured out I could guard like two, three, you know what I mean? The two, the threes, the fours, the fives. Yeah. So it ended up, you know what I mean? You know, Seattle, Seattle, you know what I mean? Then Nate got the job. Nate, Nate McMillan, was more right? Of a defense, defensive yeah. coach. So he's like, oh, we can switch. You know what I mean? You know, he, we yeah. can keep me in play with the different little lineups. I didn't need the ball. I just get tip ins or get a couple of dunks or, you know, just do some little sneaky stuff. So uh, it was the experience. Uh, uh, I got into it with Nate at the end of that experience at one of my exit, uh, exit uh, meetings. But um, because we, we just didn't meet, see eye to eye after he had started me over Ben and a bunch of other things. So um, it was a great experience. It was just rough. And I think when you go into the NBA, you need what Rashawn was talking about, a good fit. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, I was just really out there fending for myself, really taking care of Rashard. I just knew I had to keep my shit together because I knew Rashard was out of high school. So I was kind of like mentoring him making sure he was straight, you know what I mean? He was out there by himself with his homeboy, Travis, so he'd be over at my house playing video games, hmm. chilling, you know what I mean? I'd take him shopping, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, the just being a big brother to Richard and, uh, and and sticking up for hmm. us. So Seattle was a, it, it was an interesting time, but it was a, a rugged introduction to the NBA. Yeah. So you go to LA yeah. and, and talk about obviously the complete opposite kind of coach and, and organization. And, and I, I watched all the smoke yesterday with uh, Jeannie yeah. and it was fascinating for her to talk about some of the things that she talked about and how transparent she is. Mm -hmm. And from the ownership on down, uh, getting to know the players, caring about the players, they really do. Uh, obviously, yeah. And Phil obviously caring about the players and getting them to, to expand their horizons. So talk about that experience with the Lakers. Uh, the, the, the Lakers was a trip, man. Actually, uh, rest, rest in peace, my, my agent at the time, Dan Fagan, was pissed because I, I took a non-guarantee with the Lakers and I had two other guaranteed deals and a partial hmm. thing with Denver and two other teams. And I was like, man, I'm about to shit. They just won two titles. You know what I mean? I think I can make that roster. I'm looking at Mad Dog, you know, I think it was uh, Samaki, who's my dog, you know what I mean? Slava Medvedenko, yeah. Robert, I'm like, hey, I got to be able to slide in there and get some type of money. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? So stay at the crib, you know, I was staying in LA yeah, at the yeah. time, getting a chance to play, you know what I mean, with Kobe and Shaq, so I, I hopped up on that opportunity. It was weird because when I went in there and signed my contract and it was showing me the weight room and everything, I was in like every picture. I don't know if they did this on purpose, but I'm not really like a big free agent signing like that mm -hmm. at the time, but I was in like every picture in the weight room. So it was like mad dog with me guarding him. And then it was like a picture of Robert Dory or Rick Fox and I'm somewhere in the frame, you know what I mean? Because wow. uh, <laughs> we, cause actually we handled Lakers their worst, one of the worst losses at home in Laker history when I was with the Sonics. So, I don't, you know what I mean? I, I, it was always a Lakers, you know, the Lakers versus the Super Sox, the Ice Cube. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it was an interesting transition, interesting learning period. It was not cool sitting on the bench the whole time. You know what I mean? That, that shit drove me crazy. You know what I mean? It was more of a, you come into a team that just won two championships, man, going on a third, favorite to win three straight. You know what I mean? It's going to be hard to crack the lineup. You know what I mean? So, uh, uh, I never really got a chance to crack the lineup. I did get a lot, play a lot of minutes with Kobe, though. You know what I mean? A whole ton. For whatever reason, when I when I see highlights or when I'm thinking back, I always got a lot of minutes with Kobe. And I do know my dog always passed me the ball. And yeah. I tell Rashawn, Rashawn will tell you, if you blow a pass from a superstar, if Kobe, oh, T-Mac, the alpha, 
gets caught up and he comes to you, even if he's got three people on him, he gives you the little shovel pass under the basket. You better finish that shit. Make that funny style layup. Yeah. You, whatever it is, if you don't dunk it, hit everybody in there. If that ball don't go through the basket, you 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 never gonna get that ball again from him. He ain't gonna vouch for you. You know what I mean? Like, no, let's go bring him in. Let him play. Yeah, we we good. So it's kind of a stressful situation. But he used to look to me. You know what I mean? Because we had a uh, when I was at UCLA, we had the same agent, Arn Tellum, and he played up at UCLA a lot. So we had a relationship. I knew his sister. We had a relationship before that. So it was cool looking back that he was coming to me and comfortable coming to me after winning two. And this is when he was becoming the Black Mambo. This is right when he was turning the corner and going on his own shit, calling his own yep. play, in the triangle, you know, <laughs> going for 40s and a half. So if you got one of them passes, you have to come through. Great experience, though. Never forget it. I never, I, I never, always hated the fact I couldn't contribute like I want to, but uh, a press conference a long time ago, you know, Kobe mentioned that we had a, like, we got a bunch of great players on this team that are playing, like, you know, Jelani McCoy. Like, it's a lot that goes into winning three championships, and it's like having players like that to practice against and keep us sharp, you know what I mean? And having, you know, him accessible, you know, if we need him in a spot that we know we can go to him. So, it was at the time I hated it sitting on the bench, but after we won the title and you know what I mean, my career went on and I reflected, I realized how much of a blessing it was. There's a couple more things I want to get to. You're right with time. Yeah, we're good with time. Go ahead. So, um, you notice he doesn't ask me how my, how my time is. I don't give a shit about your <laughs> time, Gordon. <laughs> Go handle your business, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how was the parade? Insane, a million people all over the buildings downtown in Los Angeles. The parade was insane, bro. Insane, <laughs> insane. So, um, you guys have anything else you want to ask him about Phil Jackson or the Lakers before I move on to a mental health question? I was curious, you, Jelani. You mentioned your your agent, yeah. uh, your first agent, and the name was of was all it the shit to Fagan? ask him. You're going to ask Aren't him about agents. You said I could ask him anything I want. You're going to edit it out anyway. What do you care? Oh uh, damn, out of all this shit to ask him, you're going to talk about age. When am I going to talk to him again? Well, I don't know. <laughs> let, let that okay. shit go, Gordon. Let, yeah, let it ride. Let's, go ahead. I was just curious. You mentioned, I thought you said Dan Fagan. I did. I did. I was represented by Dan Fagan. And I just time. wondered, did Dan represent anybody in Orlando? Probably. Did he have somebody like uh, Matt Harpring or... Or Mike Doliak or somebody. Yeah. I, I'm just curious because I, 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 so. I, I was down there in the late 90s and a lot of the agents paraded through. Yeah. And I didn't really I didn't really get to meet them, but the name sounded familiar. So I was just. Uh, yeah, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't doubt it. Dan I'm just shooting super, the shit. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Shoot. We're shooting. <laughs> he worked with Orlando I, I, for I, a year. I, I That's why he was asking. It's me. really the only shooting I can do except for the 90 free throws I make. Jesus Mike, Christ. where's my Shut donation? Up. Oh, there they go. <laughs> Fuck out of here. That bullshit. 90 free throws, there Mike. Go. There they go. 90 out of 100, throws. baby. I can make 90 free throws in a row. I got video. <laughs> I don't need to, I got video. There they go. <laughs> oh, God, we don't want to go. Well, I, I got one question. Go ahead, Rashawn. Um, um, you know, I, obviously, we've had, we both had a similar experience playing, um, you know, for big universities mm -hmm. and uh, playing in the NBA. Um, what's one thing that if you could go back, what would you change and do different, uh, you know, based on, you know, now having your history solidified and what you decided, what would you go back and change that you think would make a huge impact and difference in your career? I would have blacked out on the work. I would have been one of those dudes who was in the gym at four or five o'clock in the morning. I was starting to do that. And I was doing that in Seattle before it was like a thing. I used to do it with like Shaman Williams. Shout well, out I was going to ask Williams. you about Shaman. I talked to Shaman yeah. yesterday. That's my dog. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? I used to be in there shooting with Shaman. You know what I mean? Coming there. Yeah, he thought he should be playing over uh, Gary Payton, didn't he? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I thought he yeah, should have been starting over Mookie. GP I know. Off on Wall Walker about Paul Westfall taking him off the point and putting Shaman on the point in the later during the game, and we won the game. And GP hit the shot. He was still pissed that he got moved <laughs> off. Of I'm pretty <laughs> sure Shaman wouldn't have gotten crossed that. up by Jason Williams because we knew we told him. <laughs> hey, we told G. Hey, G. Don't go in there on that. This is some white boy shit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
I'm telling you, <laughs> Still swipe his ankles, boy. Out of here playing games with this glove shit. If you try that bullshit, <laughs> do some of that slick shit. I'm telling you, you sure did. He pressed him. You know what I mean? And if you look after he whipped off him, G tried to low key trip. Uh, That's tripping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He came to he was like he came to the bench like, damn, that white boy. Talk. I was like, I told you, man. Do not go out there playing games with him. He's not like Mark Price or working in like right. your boxes. You know what I mean? He hurt. You know how Jason Williams play. I'm like, I'm telling oh, you, yeah. man. So yeah, that, he was cold. That's yeah. fine. So yeah, that that's uh that's that's good because I think, I mean, today most kids have trainers and they working out and they doing what they are doing. Yeah. You know, we we didn't necessarily have access to that. You had to do it. You know, Street yeah. ball, going to the you park. Now they got a coach that, that that you could call and text and be like, "I need to shoot now," and they'll open up the gym for you. You know, back when we played, you want to you get an answer, you want to go shoot. You got to That's a whole big ordeal you got to yeah. do. You know go to the park, so, yeah, man. And and you it, had to it, go to the park or a, yeah, a YMCA just, or something. <laughs> it makes you a basket case. You know what I mean? But it's so much, it seems so rewarding. I always admire to pick players like Kobe. Uh, Paul put in a lot of work behind the scenes. Gilbert, I just saw Gilbert, you know, the other day. You hear these dudes with these legendary routines that they did. You know what I mean? I would have just, I, I, I was trending that way. You know what I mean? But it's hard on a bid. It's, you know what I mean? We setting yeah, screens yeah. and back in the 90s, I'm playing, I got David Robinsons and Tim Duncans. I got everybody 260. I'm carrying an extra 30 or 40 pounds for no reason. You know what I mean? So I wasn't able to just, and the way we worked out in the 90s was balls to the wall. It wasn't like just come in here and get some tuna. Get some tuna. You know what I mean? It was yeah. a, it was the whole workout, you know what I mean? Yada, 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 if you wanted to do the extra stuff. So I would just say that. And I would have just, I would have been that dude that kept a little bit. I kept to myself, but I would have just would like to be a recluse <laughs> and yeah, stuck to the work and mm-hmm. took care of, the, you know, got along better with some, this something was trying. I would say this that and I would have made a couple more allies on other teams. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. was a little standoffish or see people that be like, man, I, I think I'm better than him, or I don't understand why he you know what I mean. I was worried about other people's shit too much instead of getting with somebody from the other team going to eat. Cause those ended up like employment opportunities. Like when you out of your contract, you can call the home, what shit? What you need? What you looking for? And when, as I started going on and seeing that, oh shit, they you can get your homie a job. You know what I mean? They just call the agent. What's your agent looking for? I'm looking you didn't network team. enough. You then did right. boom, boom. That's you that's, know what's that's funny, right? You know, yeah. and the, 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 you know, and and hearing your answer, I was fortunate, man. Like I did that with Steve Smith and Matumbo. Like I, I re- mm. they really sat me down, you know, and, and explained everything that you just said. Mm-hmm. you know uh, how to be a professional how to build your network and you know things like that so you know when you have when you have a veteran team of guys that is willing to share that man it, it makes a huge difference you know but it's you a know, huge sometimes difference. you gotta I figure it out on your own working stuff i was good about like like they was thought it was weird that i ran up to howard schultz and was talking to him when he bought the team you know they, i was like man can we get a starbucks machine and i was asking him about <laughs> starbucks and 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 franchises and all this shit and they're kind of like hey hey Go back on. You're out of your lane. <laughs> what are you talking about? When, when are the next time we're gonna get to talk to a CEO? Like you know, so I was right. I would just say it's the networking with the getting some allies on other teams. So, you know what I mean? So I'm I'm right. really curious because I I know that that even in the late '90s and I, I assume it's evolved, but maybe it hasn't. But I I know that the league did some I'm gonna call it onboarding with rookies. And they mm-hmm. did. They had people come in and do some seminars. Was that they did stuff the bare effective? minimum, man? It's probably yeah. they do a lot more now. But you know, we yeah, they, they do a lot. At our rookie, yeah, at our rookie transition, because we were in the same rookie transition. Oh, you know, yeah. me, you, Jake. Yeah. You know, we we were all in the same rookie. But was it not it was enough? Like, it, it was an it was it was a space filler. You know what I mean? Like it, oh. they brought people in, but we didn't know what the hell they were talking about. It wasn't explained to us exactly what we should be looking for to take from the situ- from the, uh, the scenarios. You know, they just bring somebody in here, talk about finance. They would talk about, you know, stuff, you know, following a certain protocol, like going out, you know, giving us situations. They would do like little skits, you know, yeah. saying if this happens, you know, this is, this is what you do. This is who you call. But nobody, I mean, nobody paid attention. 
Yeah, but you know, nobody you paid sleep. attention to the one lady that got up and uh, the one oh, lady yeah. got up. She it was she was real pretty, and she had been in the lobby. You know, it was a real strict rules. You can't do this. You can't leave the property. You can't be seen talking to girls. You can't drink. You can't smoke. They got all these weird rules. But there's this one uh, good looking lady that was in the lobby, right? And everybody was trying to holler at her, low key. Hey, we in room this that right? So like as the thing goes on, maybe second day or something like that, she yeah. comes up to one of the speakers and she's like, "Hi, my name is so and so and so and so, and I have AIDS." Yep, I, that was powerful, bro. Right. So everybody was like, "That's that's." So she's a she's a plant, yeah, right? Right. She's a plant, and, and the idea is, is is for her to entice. She goes into her deal. That's how close, you know. A couple of people. I'm not gonna name a name. You don't have to do all that. <laughs> they invited me to their room. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yada yada yada. She was like, "I'm wow. I'm pro- positive. Not everybody has condoms." So wow. she was like, you know, he was talking about decision making and like that's how close you can come to being with a promiscuous woman in the lobby and then. So it's, it, it was it's a mild version of scared straight, basically. That's what it was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's when everybody woke up. Then they started talking. They started talking about the dude who was selling drugs. Then it, 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 it like crescendo. <laughs> <laughs> it went from her to the dude. You know, you know I was in. I'm, wow. I'm, 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 the documentary so and so was about me. I think it was Boston George or one of that one of that crew. Like then they started. Yeah. It, so they had some good shit. And of course, everybody was then like, I'm gonna forget who it was. Forgot what player it was at one time. Was like, uh, shit, I got twelve bricks in his head right now. <laughs> yeah. You guys, you guys would both, you guys would both uh, change the the rookie indoctrination process your your first year into something that that provided more <clears throat> useful information for you yeah. in terms I, I think, of your I career. I think it needs to be. I think it needs to be career uh, the whole career. I, I, I just you know rookie whatever it needs to be yeah not once it needs to be annually yeah Yeah. it needs to be annually yeah the mbpa is doing a better job they're taking guys yeah now they are yeah they're taking guys to the bahamas and everything and having uh some workshops and so it's gotten progressively better but like like rashawn said it needs to you got to check in on every third you just can't have one talking down on everybody you know, using big words and shit you know what i mean to guys are the one and dones and you know what i mean yada yada do different countries and different background. It's like, like he said, it needs to happen like you know every quarter, basically. That's good mm. stuff. Yeah, instead of instead of making it for three days, where yeah, you know, after the first fifteen hours, you know, you know, you're not you're taking burned out. More information. You burnt out. Yeah. Breakout <laughs> rooms. Burnt out. You got the big thing. You got the breakout rooms. You got this. It's, it's just a long. Day. I mean, can you imagine coming into an NBA franchise and in the first two days having to learn? Uh, the entire the whole I mean, playbook, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it has to be. It has to be gradually taught so that you can assimilate and be ready to move on to layer two <laughs> kinds of instruction. That was more of a so. box check. Yeah, box check. Yeah. That's the end of part one of the interview with Jelani McCoy with guest hosts Coach K and Rashawn McLeod right here in the Sports Deli, and we hope that you listen to part two of the interview with Jelani McCoy, former NBA champion with the Los Angeles Lakers in 2002 and former UCLA Bruin right here in the Sports Deli. Remember, your voice matters when fighting systemic racism. Read a book, acknowledge your white privilege, watch a movie about institutional racism, call your local or state representatives, and or have a conversation with someone that doesn't look like you. We have to change the economic, educational, police, housing, prison, and voting suppression narratives that currently need to be changed in this country and the only way to do that is to listen and learn and then help be a part of the mobilization and change that we want to see remember you can always send us an email to the sports deli at gmail.com yeah. until next time please mask up still remember black lives matter peace <laughs>